Hey, what is up you guys? It is me, Nicole Birdie, and today we are going to be talking about a giant theory that I have put together and I'm pretty proud of if I do say so myself, which I do, or if I don't say so myself, it doesn't matter. If you want to know one thing about me, it's that I love audio dramas. They're podcasts that are fictional and they tell a story. I've grown up on these from like Adventures in Odyssey and that's the only one I can think of, but I grew up watching them, or listening to them, and uh, I found these about two years ago, and I've just fallen in love ever since. So today, we are going to be talking about these shows right here, here's a list. They include Ars Paradoxia, Wolf 359, The Bright Session, Station to Station, Under Pressure, The Lavender Ladies, Project Ozma, uh, I have a list right here, don't mind me reading, uh, <laughs> Steal the Stars, Mars Falls, Tides, The Strange Case of Starship Iris, uh, 2298, EOS 10, Inkworm, Diamond in the Void, We Fix Space Junk, and Girl in Space. Yes, 17 shows. It is a lot. It is a really big theory. And right here are the shows that you want to get caught up on if you don't want spoilers. These have very big spoilers. They include Ars Paradoxia, uh, Wolf 359, The Bright Sessions, Steal the Stars, The Strange Case of Starship Iris, 2298, We Fix Space Junk, and Girl in Space. These are all some key points in the theory and I recommend getting caught up on those if you don't want spoilers. And if you don't mind spoilers, then continue on ahead. And if you want to check out any of these shows, I'm going to put links in the description to their websites or Twitter or whatever. And you should definitely go check them out. They all include sci-fi of some kind or some are just lifestyle. They're all really, really good shows and I really recommend them. And before we begin, I do want to know that I'm not actually caught up on all these shows. Ars Paradoxia, Mars Falls, and EOS 10 are shows I'm currently working on catching up with, but my theory still stands with the shows. So, we are going to continue on to the theory, and I have divided the theory up into three parts. One, the beginning of space travel and Earth's discovery of extraterrestrial life. Two, a time of peace. And three, the destruction of the universe. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? Alright, so if you don't want spoilers for these shows I have mentioned, turn away now, come back when you're caught up. But if you want to continue on this little fairy journey with me, then let's continue. Also, please forgive me for mispronouncing a lot of words, because it's gonna happen. We begin with the events of Ars Paradoxia. Sometime in the 21st century, the exact year is unknown, Dr. Sally Grimson is sucked back in time to about 1944. Her story continues through the years 1944 and 1955-ish, um, with a few jumps back in the 21st century. Key organizations at this time are ODAR, which were originally, as we found out in the Bright Sessions um, crossover, was a scientific group, but then they kind of turned into um, a little secret government organization. Not entirely sure what goes on, because again, I'm not caught up, but those are just, I guess, key organizations. So basically, that's the event and time travels are discovered and all that. Um, as mentioned in Wolf 359, humans made first contact with aliens in the year 1978. Exciting year. This occurred on the USS Tiamat, which was stationed around the star Procyon. Aliens, otherwise known as Dear Listeners, took the forms of crew members and multiplied at an alarming rate, and they all had the memories of the people they were taking the place of. So there were like two Sallys, two Marias, I don't know the names right now, but it got alarming and as food dwindled down, everyone began to panic and no one knew who the real, like, original person was. And it was kind of scary. This continued on until Commander Elizabeth Zhang, I forgive me for mispronouncing her name, uh, self-destructed the station, just killed everyone, was just like, we can't, we can't have these aliens going to Earth, it's going to be mass chaos and people are going to die, so, so instead she chose to self-sacrifice and it's kind of sad actually. This event would lead Goddard Futuristics, which was in charge of the mission, to search out extraterrestrial life and they would continue this journey for decades. Key employees of Goddard Futuristics are Marcus Cutter and Dr. Miranda Price. Uh, we should also note that these people are really old. We know they've undergone a few modifications, and by few I mean a lot, 
and they're a lot older than the average lifespan. It's unknown exactly how old they are, but they do have the technology apparently to expand, to extend the average life. But it's also unknown to the public, so it's kind of a secret, but we do have the technology. On January 16th, 2010, Captain Isabel Lovelace and her crew will reach the Hephaestus. In late March of 2013, uh, Rene Minkowski's mission is launched into space and soon afterwards they will also reach the Hephaestus, but Captain Isabel Lovelace and her crew are not there. Um, if you want more details on that, you should check out Wolf 359. We know for a fact that by 1978, long distance space travel and staying around a star, a different star than our own, is already possible. Um, the USS uh, Ti Tiamat, Tiamat, the USS Tiamat already proved that people can travel across stars and it's not known how long and how far they can go, but it's possible. And so by 2010, imagine how like upgraded that technology is. And this is technology kept from the public. The public doesn't know about this. And by this time, like they already know he there are alien life forms out there. And so they're sending people to go find these life forms and people and it's all kind of a mess, but you know, it's pretty cool. The events of Wolf 359 will leave the human absolute knowledge that there are indeed aliens. They have evidence. And this is all because of our wonderful Eiffel who has come into contact with the dear listeners. After the events of the show, it can be assumed that uh, news of extraterrestrial life spread from contractor to private contractor to secret government organizations and, you know, a little, a little something for that news. But it began to spread thoroughly throughout groups of people, just remained away from the public. Shortly after the events of Wolf 359 and the Festus crew returns to Earth, the events of the Bright Session, Station to Station, Under Pressure, and the Lavender Ladies can occur, which is about 2017-2018, you know, modern day from when I'm recording this. In the events of the Bright Sessions, which was a great crossover episode, Sam Barnes comes into contact with Anth Anthony, I'm gonna butcher this name, please forgive me, Anthony Partridge, who occurs on Ars Paradoxia. And I don't know who he is, but we come into contact with him and we find out that they're in a black room outside of time. Um, Anthony is from October 8th, 1943, while Sam is from 2016. We find out the events of Ars Paradoxia and the knowledge that time travel exists is not public knowledge by, and we can like decipher this by Sam being utterly confused about what's going on. Key organizations of 2016 uh, are the AM, uh, which does research on atypicals, which are people who, who have special skills and abilities. Basically, they have superpowers, um, as we see in the events of the Bright Sessions. The director of this organization is Ellie Wadsworth. Uh, shortly after the Bright Sessions, the events of Station to Station Under Pressure uh, and the Lavender Ladies play out, uh, it just include them in the theory because that's what's going on in the world. It's pretty modern day. Technology is evolving, knowledge is growing. Um, as we see from station to station under pressure, they have higher tech than we do in our own modern world, but it might just because they are on research stations or whatever. And the exact year for these shows are not exactly known, but it's modern day. And still, throughout all this, the general public remains unaware of alien life. Around the year 2020, uh, a top secret organization, so secret that even the government doesn't really know about it, uh, sends two individuals to the Ozma station. The events of Project Ozma play out, which is where these two individuals will come into contact, like real actual contact with aliens at a conference. It's the first real step to humanity becoming one with the intergalactic universe. Uh, my prediction for the show is alien life's forms and that there are aliens will remain uh, not known to the public that they'll keep this under wraps and a little hush hush, you know what I mean? And also around this time, we will see more private contractors coming into the knowledge of there's alien life, as we can see in the events of Steel the Stars, which probably occur around 2025 is my guess, just a few years later. 
the events of Steel the Stars will play out, and as we see as the show ends, big spoiler, aliens take over. There is this alien life form called the Moss that takes over humans and pretty much uses them as a host. And that we can kind of assume that humans know aliens exist after that. You, you know, alien Moss is gonna be taking over people. I think people are gonna be know what's going on. Uh, my prediction is a large percentage of the human population, mostly in North America, somewhat in Central America, is taken over by the Moss. Europe and Asia and Africa and everyone else across the ocean will band together to fight the Moss, but then more people will get lost because this alien race is kind of indestructible. And humans are like, we want to live, please. And so some kind of treaty will be made out where the Moss can stay in like North America, Central America, and everyone else will be left alone. And maybe offering some people as tribute or whatever, we don't really know but hopefully humans survive, question mark. That's my prediction. And also around this time, we should be noting that people are leaving Earth. By 2074, there will be a colony on Mars as seen in Mars Falls. By the late 21st century or early 22nd century, the events of tides will occur. It's a really big step in the human discovery of other life because we're exploring! We're going across stars now and we're exploring life forms and planets that we never thought we were going to see. From there we see the humans discovering life forms that are smarter than themselves. They build technology, humans are growing, and we're learning about our own universe and you know the world, the universe, becomes a little bit smaller because we can see everything. Then the humans will face a life form unlike anything they've ever seen before. A few years before 2191, a great war will break out between the humans and the Dwarnians. Uh, important governments to note are the IGR and the Dwarnian Federation. This all occurs in the strange case of Starship Iris. So the humans will go to war against these aliens and will win. But as we later find out, the Dwarnians just got bored. They could have easily wiped up the humans and that's kind of scary. Um, the events of the strange case of Starship Iris will play out at this time and it's important to note that the universe is being colonized by humans. There are multiple planets and asteroids and they're all being colonized by these humans. There's not so much of mixing of races between aliens and humans. We're not entirely sure why. Maybe this is just a group of humans or maybe it's all of human population, but they're not really tolerant of aliens yet or extraterrestrial life. Excuse me. Over time, gradually, they will grow to accept their extraterrestrial neighbors, and life will get a lot better, hopefully. By 2098, ha ha ha, title of the show, uh, over a century later, things have changed. The IGR is no longer in power, and instead, different private contractors will have more power over the universe, one of these being Caldwell Enterprises. Um, all other names are unknown at this time, but there are going to be other people because the, the Codwell Enterprises doesn't own everything. Uh, a portion of humanity lives cut off from the rest of the universe in a simulation is what we're assuming it is, uh, with just the internet, that's all they have. And they live this life given numbers as names. 24, one of these individuals will break free from his group and run away into space on the Kavatica in 2099 with an unnamed woman who is a girl in space. <laughs> one day these two will become the uh, parents of X from Girl in Space, but that's gonna come later. They're both important, but not at this time. It's mostly unknown what becomes of them, but we learn by Chen in Girl in Space that they'd be gone for 30 years. Personally though, I don't think this fact is 100% correct. I think we're being misled by the writers a little bit. Um, the reason for this is one, uh, Chen doesn't say which calendar he's using. We don't know if it's an Earth calendar or Pluto calendar or just a completely different calendar. We don't know what calendar they use, but also the knowledge that Ra, a star, like a star in the sky, that the Gavadaga is going around is man-made. It's a man-made star, but people don't know that and people would notice. Astrologists, people who study the stars would say something and know something and that should be public knowledge. Also, if you're traveling across space, you don't want to, it would have to be put in the charts or else you're going to be zooming through the sky and suddenly phew, 
blow up because he ran into a star. Um, so it has to be have been long enough that people just accept that the star is in the sky, but 30 years is not enough time, so I think it's actually been a few thousand years. This is where we enter our time of peace. It's not really a very long time, we don't really have a lot to say on it, because it's mostly just, you know, peaceful, great time to be alive. The events of EOS 10, Inkworm, Dining in the Void will all occur during this time. My prediction is EOS 10 occurs around 3014. Inkworm takes place in 3017, as stated in the show, and will continue into 3018, where Dining in the Void will continue out and its show will play out. Uh, key organizations at this time to note are the Inkworm family and a group just called The Family. Uh, they are not very much talked about, but they are there. I think some past governments or whatever organizations have kind of morphed into this or at least integrated into it. Um, but these are key factors. We should also note that Earth is united under one government as stated in uh, or kind of hinted at in Dining in the Void because a character named Mars is part of Earth's military, not a specific government, but Earth as a whole. Um, during this time, life forms at our peace with one another. Many species will travel across space and will go on the same stations, learn about each other, and knowledge will be spread, art will be made, knowledge will spread, art will be made, uh, information will be learned and new technologies will form and just it's a great time to be alive you know it's like a golden era if you will a renaissance for the uh, universe and then sadly this leads to the universe to kind of be uninhabitable and die two rival corporations will rise to power and they are called automnicon and the trap family corporation as seen in we fix space junk the two will fight for power and the whole all the events of we fix space junk will occur which i predict will happen over a few hundred years uh we learned that earth has died and humans can't live there anymore um, humans are actually scattered across the universe, living on different planets, interbreeding with other species, and, you know, it, it happens. The two corporations will fight each other to a universal war, and everything will be destroyed. Eventually their names will change, but their power will still be there. My prediction is Automnicon will merge with Codwell Enterprises because, you know, bigger, stronger, better, and the Trap Mining Corporation will form the Empress Conglomerate along with a few other smaller but still powerful corporations. Um, and we will see these both arrive in Gurlin's space. This war will destroy everything. People can no longer survive on planets and it's gonna be a big mess. Those who are left will have to find some other way to survive and band together and search out the last bits of life, which on Exocetion, the Cathatica, and the events of Girl in Space will take place. It's unknown what will happen next, as of this theory, Girl in Space is the farthest we've gone into the travel of this theory. That's as far as we're going. My prediction is it takes place around the year 38, 36, something like that? I don't know. It's gonna be a really far in the future, but it's still happening. It's unknown what will happen next. Uh, Girl in Space is still an ongoing show, and maybe it will answer our questions of what happens after the universe is uninhabitable. Will X somehow be able to help, like, revive planets? Or will they all be living on space stations forever, growing their own food in greenhouses? Maybe Girl in Space will have the answers to these questions, or maybe another show will pop up showing and telling us the story of after the universe dies. Only time will really tell. And that's my theory. It's kind of open-ended because these shows aren't finished yet, and well, like I said, time will only tell what's going to happen. Maybe there are more shows that fit into this theory that I just haven't found yet, and maybe you know them. If you do, you should totally comment below or tweet at me and we'll just talk about this. It'll be cool and fun. We'll have a discussion about it. Theorize. Let's do this. Um, maybe more shows will pop up in the future and it will change the theory. That's okay. Um, but this was something I really enjoyed thinking about. I like these kind of things. They're always fun. Big universe theory. Um, so yeah, let me get, let me know what you guys what you guys think. Um, if you like this video, give it a big thumbs up. Maybe share it with some friends. Oh uh, yeah. I hope y'all have a wonderful day. Mwah.